the biggest thing is to see yourself as you really are and understand yourself and love yourself and just find that self-acceptance and love because then you will find more people who see you the more you're unafraid to show yourself. Ashmi, thank you so much for being on the Soul Seeker podcast. I am so excited to get to know you. We connected of all places on Instagram, and I don't even remember how. I remember the post that I saw you write, and I was uh, one of those like ones with slides, and I was reading it, and I was like, yes, yes. And I was like, who wrote this? And then I went to your profile, and I noticed that we had similar stories in that we both grew up in Silicon Valley and also did our career there, only to realize, huh. I thought I'd feel different, almost like the movie Soul at the end of that. No spoiler alert there, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time. I know that the time of recording, you're in Hawaii and you kind of bounce it around between like Australia and just living your best life. So appreciate you making the time. Welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. Thank you so much, Sam, for having me. I'm super excited. Sweet. So we're going to get into some fun esoteric conversations and topics but before we do i'd really like to uh have you kind of paint the picture of what you were doing in your career after you graduated college from notre dame being in california then went out there and came back to do the silicon valley thing working at facebook and all the things and just describe what that lifestyle looked like in terms of when you were in the corporate world and then how you heard that whisper and made the transition mm -hmm. to follow your soul yeah, you know, at the time it was a dream job. So I got um, a job at Facebook as probably my first step out into a more professional career. Um, it started as an internship, but then I joined full time. And um, yeah, it was such a dream for me. I was like, is this too good to be true? Um, I really felt like I manifested it. So I started tuning back into my power that I was so connected to as a child knowing I can create and get what I want in life. Um, from there, my path really bloomed. Um, I joined Brandy Zuckerberg at her new kind of startup company, media company. And, and that's we were, Mark, Randy's Mark's sister, right? Mark yes, Zuckerberg's sister. Yeah, yeah. and it, we were one of four founding members and we worked in her garage. So it felt like the Silicon Valley dream. And at the time, of course, I loved it and I have nothing negative to say about that period of my life. Um, after that, I joined a bigger technology company and um, it was really such a huge step up for me in terms of responsibility and just pushing myself to the max where towards the end, I really burnt out mm -hmm. and I was working 90 to 100 hours. It was crazy amounts, weekends, holidays, and it felt like work was my life and it was my passion but it was all I thought about, all I focused on, and I lost that connection to my spirit. Uh, I felt really anxious, like with heart palpitations every morning, wow. uh, just checking my phone if I missed any urgent calls. Everything was urgent and time sensitive, you know how it is. Right. And uh, I had to leave, and I felt like by that time, I just saw that what was once a dream for myself, my old identity, was no longer what I wanted. And mm -hmm. I felt like if I keep doing this for years and years, uh, it's not really going to fulfill me. It's not everything I want anymore. I felt like there's more to life. So that started my seeking. Mm, that's beautiful. So one of the things that comes up for me is something I've been talking about for a while now is Soul Life Balance. And that's the title of my most recent book. And really, that's what's missing in the work culture is like we talk about work life balance, and you and I haven't really connected yet. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But for me, it's looking at the archetypal energy of yin and yang or yang, right? And the yang, the yang energy is more in alignment with the masculine. It's about structure, obligation, very much work in terms of like due deadlines, due dates. And like you said, everything is urgent. So clearly, in like the work-life balance formula that work is associated to that yang energy well when you're someone who is 
working in corporate and quote unquote hustle culture or anyone really, but in your given situation, you were working, as you said, about 90 plus hours a week. I mean, a normal work week is 40 hours. Normally when I talk about this, it's like, okay, there's 24 hours in a day. Most people spend maybe about eight hours working. Hopefully you get eight hours of sleep. That leaves eight hours left over in your life. Well, you can't just be going all the time. So it's not really a full eight hours. And if you look at someone in your situation, it's far less than eight hours. So really, when we look at work-life balance, the life side of the formula is also yang energy. So for me, it's like looking at this and being like, where's the yin? Where's the fluidity? Where's the connection within? So that's why I'm so passionate about soul life balance and reframing it so that we understand that work is a part of life and putting our soul first and foremost. So curious from you just hearing that kind of for the first time, being someone who is like in the thick of startup culture, how would have practicing soul life balance you think made a difference in your life back then? Mm. You know, what's really strange is once you're immersed in that hustle culture, Um, Even my friendships and kind of just after work hours were around either networking or talking about startup ideas, you know, that culture. And it was exciting, but it turned out it affected my energy so much where I was being more in that masculine energy as who I am, as who Mm -hmm. I related to myself as even on the weekends, even from the way I spoke to the way I dressed It was all still in that persona. And I think I lost that connection to nature, to following my passion just for the sake of it, to creating art, to taking even just an hour to have a bath even, you know, and not think about work. Um, Towards the end, when I was feeling like leaving Uh, my career there I actually started listening to that inner voice a little bit more Mm -hmm. Um, I took some time no matter how late I got off work sometimes it was 9 p.m I went to a coffee shop and started just writing again for myself and I used to journal as a child but I stopped for a while so through that voice of writing and channeling and coming back to my heart I started really listening to what do I really want in my life and that message that guidance came through so yeah I know a lot of people who are in the hustle and bustle um, might not feel like they have time but even at just five minutes or 30 minutes to do something just for yourself Mm -hmm. it really helped me yeah shift my energy totally and I just started something yesterday called the five minute journal have you heard about it yeah yeah, I'm sure sh- I'm sure I've heard about it, but I've been like so thick in the quote unquote doing the work that like anytime in my circle of people talking about journaling, it's more like uh Julia Cameron's uh the artist way, mm-hmm. morning pages, 20 minutes nonstop, don't let the pen lift up, what a stream of consciousness, and like different types of journaling that are go very deep. So I, I'm getting into public speaking. I heard one of my mentors uh, talk about the five minute journal. And at first, my first reaction was like, five minutes, huh? And then I was like, you know what? The season I'm in, that would be really nice because right now I am kind of leaning more in the life side of soul life balance and you know, 3D, building a business, all that type of stuff. I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll check this out. So I just started it yesterday and I'm bringing this up for anyone that is feeling like they might not have time to journal or to go within or for or has resistance to journaling because let's face it a lot of us have resistance to the idea of journaling nonstop for 20 minutes and this five minute journal is so awesome it's just these little prompts that help you to find gratitude not only that like The first uh, 20 pages or so has like a lot of science and research behind the the process of journaling. So it's not just like you're getting this book that has uh, small journaling prompts that you can do in like three minutes, you know, have you checked it out? I love that. Yeah, I've heard of it and I do my own kind of mix. So sometimes it's just five minutes with a prompt or anything that comes through. And sometimes it's more of a stream of consciousness that goes pretty long, but the key is finding something that works for you. And I think for some people, like writing is that natural expression or way to connect with your soul guidance. Mm -hmm. And for others, it might be art or singing or just talking with a friend. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So to get back to your story, you found the time after getting off work at like around 9 p.m. to go to a coffee shop <laughs> and do some writing. Oh, that sounds great. Probably where were you living? Uh, oh, did you San say San Francisco more? in the yeah. center of, yeah. I, I figured San Francisco. And for me, I couldn't, I always uh, dislike going to SF, yeah. the city. Mm -hmm. But um, anyways, yeah, I could just imagine uh, what that would be like. So you were going there, you're journaling, you're starting to hear the whisper. How did this really transpire to ultimately for you to say yes, and then have like the knowing of what you're going to do next? Or did you just more surrender and go with the flow? Yeah, I had a, an amazing mentor at the time, and she really helped reflect for me in addition to my journaling. Mm. Um, and it was literally like the suffocation, the burnout was so great. It was rock bottom for me. And funnily, that frequency also was reflected outside of me. So it was rock bottom for the company. Uh, the company was tanking. It was about to just have a quick sale, you know, and just um, we fired about 40 employees and it's about to go down. So I wasn't, you know, going to continue there and try to find another job. Instead of that, what felt more expansive is I need to rest and I need, mm. just need to follow my heart. And the first exciting idea was to actually travel the world um, and work remotely. So the idea of being a digital nomad, I'm using air quotes, that felt like the next step towards expansion, even though it still carries some of the energy of hustle and bustle and productivity and that energy is still in that community. It's, it felt really exciting for me. So that's where I headed next. Um, of course, it was still scary, but once I knew, sometimes you just have that knowing and you, you know, I got to do it. This is it. I'm young. Like, you know, I just want to make the most of my life. And this is what I need to do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I similar to you, I would imagine, but I hear a lot of, from friends or just from different people that they have that little whisper to travel or whatever it might be. And there's so much resistance that builds yeah. up and the, it only gets harder and harder. So do you have any words of wisdom to help someone that might be experiencing that now or maybe know someone that's going through that? The resistance and fear is going to be there anyway. And for me, it doesn't matter how far I've come in my journey with every new step outside my comfort zone, the doubts are there. But right. it's to realize like, is that suffocation, that fear, that resistance worth staying where you are? And, or is it worth taking that leap? And one kind of practical question was, if you are where you are for another 10 years or another two years, just feeling that resistance, that stuckness, that wanting for more, but then pulling yourself back into your comfort zone, could you actually handle 10 more years of this? And my answer was a clear no, right? So once you ask yourself those hard questions, it starts becoming more and more clear. And then I think the big step or the big leap might feel too scary. Like, oh, I need to somehow, you know, travel and financially, you know, thrive. That might feel a bit too scary because it's so far out of where you are now. But maybe it's just a one week holiday or a one week staycation or something that helps you get out of the fear mind chatter and connect with your heart, that trust within. Because I promise that trust is within you that knowing is within you. And once you open up to it, even for an hour, you'll start noticing more synchronicities or ideas or opportunities that make you feel guided or that offer you the next step. Absolutely. And uh, maybe we can get to at some point as we progress through your story to like mm -hmm. manifesting, because one of the things one of my coaches shout out to Kyle Kingsbury uh, recommended to a good friend of mine. Uh, she's in a situation where she's a single mom and, you know, she with the kid and whatnot, she needs to uh, stay in that certain town, but wants to move somewhere else. And his recommendation was kind of what you were saying in terms of doing that bite size sample mm -hmm. size um, with manifesting. 
manifesting, we can't come from a place of like desire and lack and not having that experience. So his recommendation was actually to go to that place that you would like to move to get used to the lifestyle. When you come back home, you can meditate like into that frequency and manif manifest it as if it's already happened. And I, that seems like stuff that you may be into. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I'm all about it. I feel like my whole life has led me to really discovering the magic of the universe, which is also yourself and the power within. And I've kind of made my life an experiment of, okay, right. show me the power of this because I know it's true to some degree, but of course there's doubt. And I feel it's true when I read books about it and, you know, the experts talk about it or, you know, people you might put on a pedestal, but how can it be really true for me? And that was the question mm. that kind of guided my soul inquiry. Um, I really made my travels this, of course, I was traveling on the outer, you know, expanding and just going to different countries, but it was more so a journey within. And I really let myself make it this journey of my soul. Absolutely. It's, it's so it's such an interesting way to put it in terms of like traveling outwardly and not just experiencing the world with our five senses, like quantum mm -hmm. physics teaches the outer world's a reflection in the inner world, but literally like traveling to is Australia the first place you went or where'd you go? First? It's actually where I landed last and oh, okay. it wasn't even on the map. So basically I started off in Cape Town and I did this, um, freelancer kind of remote worker retreat where we all lived in villas and we co-worked we worked together and shared ideas but also explored these similar topics of how do we create an unconventional life that's more aligned with my heart so I did meet more like-minded people who were kind of where I was at in that journey and it really helped me realize wow this isn't weird there's people who want to do this and it's possible and they have amazing stories um, I went to Tel Aviv, I went to Tokyo, because um, I have family there, I went to Thailand, I went to Bali, I actually ended up living in Bali, I, I fell in love with it, and then I found love in Bali, and he's nice. from Australia, so I moved to Australia, so none of it was really planned. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And that's the best way. And I could imagine that being pretty uncomfortable coming from the, the back, the startup culture background that you had. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was a huge leap into the unknown. <laughs> was there a certain point, like, were there any like medicine, like plant medicines you worked with or anything else where you had like a massive spiritual awakening experience or was it something that started to unfold slowly and gradually? I think both. So in the beginning, I was really opening up to the magic of the universe. And I started seeing number synchronicities to the point where it wasn't even funny. I saw 1111 probably a 1000 times in a, a day. And I was like, where? What? What is this? Like, why is this happening? And I started realizing, oh, this reality is more fluid than I thought. Um, yeah. And synchronicities were happening left and right and I think it's because my attitude was more so show me the magic I started noticing things around me and when you travel it's kind of easier to get in that state mm -hmm. but I felt my heart opening I was having crazy vivid dreams mm -hmm. um yeah learning things about reality in the universe that just blew my mind um I was reading a lot too because my analytical mind wanted to get confirmation <laughs> right. so a lot about quantum physics or the universe, the law of attraction. And then um, when I landed in Thailand, I did have more so a dark night of the soul, which mm. some people call it that where every belief system, everything I thought I knew just shattered and flipped upside down. And I learned that there's so much more to this world, good and bad than I ever thought. Um, and coming out of that in Bali, I started really connecting with my heart again and noticing how I do create my reality and it is moment by moment. So I didn't do any plant medicines, but breath work was huge for me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is just as powerful. <laughs> it's like shifts your consciousness to another kind of wave, another frequency. Um, and 
oh, I have never talked about this on a podcast, but once I was uh, meditating a lot at that time and eating really clean, having clean water and food and fruit, I stopped having meat and alcohol. And that's just unique to where I was at mm -hmm. and what I was resonating with. Not like everyone has to do that, but in my dreams, I was, I'd wake up and it's like, I'm half awake. I know I'm awake, but then I'd feel this like buzzing sensation, this vibration really, really intense throughout my whole body. And I saw images through my third eye with my eyes closed. And it was like, there were flashing numbers or symbols or very crystal clear images, like, like a TV screen in my head. Mm -hmm. And I've heard of clairvoyance before and people who can see stuff like that, but it never actually happened to me. And once it started happening, it's like, oh my God, it's real. <laughs> so, you know, once you have those physical experiences and it's unique to everyone, you start actually trusting that there is more. Mm. Yeah, it, that's wild. It's almost, uh, it sounds like astral projection, perhaps the way you described the movie screen. I, I hear a lot of people that astral travel explain it that way in terms mm. of looking like a movie screen, maybe. Yeah, yeah, either that or just visions. So it wasn't like I was having a full on dream, but it was like right. lots of images flashing at me and messages and all kinds of things I can't even explain. Mm. Has that progressed with you since then? Yeah, so finally it continued and it would happen so randomly. So sometimes once a month, sometimes twice a week. Um, but then there was a moment where I actually started getting scared of it because mm -hmm. it was so intense. And I'd hear this clanging in my right ear, like a cowbell. And it, the energy was just so strong. And I'd start seeing things that I was afraid I would manifest. Like, for example, I'd start seeing something I didn't want to manifest. And I'm like, maybe because I see it, it might actually happen. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I kind of saw like the Amazon rainforest burning like a month before the fires happened. Mm -hmm. So I think I got too scared and I shut that part of myself off. <laughs> just through my fear, right. even though my, my heart's like, I do want to connect. I want to see more. So it hasn't happened in a while since that fear. Mm. That's an interesting thing to bring up. Uh, the fact that you saw the Amazon uh, rainforest uh, burning before it actually happened. I have a good friend, a really close friend who has a similar uh, gift where she'll have like a dream and then it happens and it could be labeled as good or bad, right? And that's yeah. the thing that we get so caught up in is the attachment to these labels. And I mean, I would be, I'd be curious to hear from you what you think of this topic, because I can't sit here and say like, oh, the rainforest uh, burning down. Yeah, I just, we say it's bad, but it's it's all it's all perfect. And it's just how it is. Or, you know, a serial killer or someone murder or rape, any of this stuff, like to say like, it's, it, that's not a bad thing because everything is all perfect. Like there's this fine line of spiritually bypassing, which basically means using your spiritual, for the listeners, I know you know this, but for using your spiritual beliefs to justify a way of being, and it seems like more and more, uh, I'm starting to see so many people in the spiritual community look at something that I would label as like a not good thing. And then, and then being like, all is perfect. Now I trust the divine plan. I'm like, mm -hmm. come back to earth, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Our human experiences and our pain and our suffering are so real and valid. And in this 3D realm, this is what we actually came here to experience. And of course it's real. Of course it's painful. Of course it's challenging. And I feel like we can't shove our heads in the sand and ignore mm -hmm. it. And there's things that are so traumatic that happen to individuals, but also collectively, we have been through so much trauma with from everything from child trafficking to you know just media manipulation to all the fear that's injected in, into our consciousness. Um, there's been a huge crime against humanity. And then, you know, I know people say, well, don't be a victim. They didn't do it to you. But I'm like, in this 3D realm, it did happen to us. And you might say, okay, from a higher perspective of source and the fact that we are one consciousness, um, we are experiencing all that is and 
you know, like everything out there could be a creation of this collective consciousness and this including our traumas and our pains and our fears, but it doesn't mean this real physical experience is not valid. So we have to honor the human experience while also holding the knowing and that trust within. Um, but there is a balance, like you said. Absolutely. And then taking it, this is the way I want to take it. I didn't kind of connect it there, but, um, in terms of like you wanting to lean into this specific gift more of seeing things that happen, but then it'd be scary or, you know, you being like, okay, I know that my thoughts create my reality because quantum physics teaches this. And not only does it teach this, but I've experienced firsthand being mindful of my thoughts and seeing how it reflects yeah. outwardly. So it's kind of like this weird paradox to be in. So how do you navigate that? Oh, good question. Um, I've learned to lean into trust in myself, in life, in the universe. And this is a perspective where even if chaotic, scary, unwanted things happen in my outer reality, I can honor my feelings and my fear and my emotions around it. But deep down, I trust that everything's going to be okay. I trust that I'm growing through this. I trust that I will reach a higher perspective or peace or whatever it's supposed to be giving me. Um, and I think that trust in life is essential to practice. Otherwise, you're just going to get flung, to, flung around by everything that happens and mm -hmm. forget your part in okay i might not be able to control this circumstance or this situation but i can shift my perspective my thoughts my response to it it's actually quite um, relevant right now i'm in my family home and um, my sister is dealing with lots of uh, health and physical mental emotional upheavals ups and downs um, and even being in this environment, um, can I walk as this light of calm and love so that it can radiate to myself and my family? Because getting pulled into the drama, the noise out there is not gonna help anyone. So it's just nice to practice. It doesn't mean I can do it perfectly every time, but right. it's nice to remember that. How How is, uh, you mentioned that you're with your family and uh, sending healing towards your sister as well, of course, but with your whole family, how is the family connection like our, because I know at least for myself and a lot of people I know, like we're kind of like the the one that's out there in the family versus like okay. the family full, fully being on board. So I'm curious being in like close corridors um how that yeah is going yeah i feel like a lot of people who resonate with these messages are the black sheep of the family or in a more positive way you are the light worker the way shower right. showing them a new way of being it's really interesting though because i've come to see the gifts in each of my family members and they're not mm -hmm. they don't see everything the way i do but okay my sister um she was diagnosed autistic and she doesn't fit into the conventional box of the world, but because she's so pure in her heart and she's so connected and she's actually very empathic and intuitive um, and the way she lives, she refuses to fit into the conventional box like she can't. So she is a way show her in her own way of mm -hmm. love, of being, of how she lives. Um, and, but, you know, from being open to, I guess, remembering our spirituality and our connection to our soul. I am kind of the own, like the one in the family that's kind of sharing these things. And it sounds crazy at first to my parents, but my dad's actually quite open to it. Same. Uh, yeah. It's funny because he's really opened up um, through the healing journey of my sister, looking into more holistic medicines, you know, frequency healing, energy work, um, he's really awake to the outer world stuff, so we can talk about many things together. Um, but yeah, I've kind of walked a really unconventional path because uh, compared to my relatives, you know, coming from a traditional background, half Indian, mm. half Japanese, um, the way I live is probably really way out there and strange. And even the way I talk nowadays, <laughs> like 
I don't recognize myself from who I was. Yeah. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> if label it. yeah. I'm happy for it. <laughs> yeah. More and more recently, I've started to like look backwards at how I got here and be like, man, this is, this is nuts. Like I, I knew <laughs> like things were uh, progressing and going a certain mm. way, but like now I'm teaching yoga and I would have never thought that I would have even done a yoga teacher training, let alone mm -hmm. teach. So, and leading men's groups, just different things. But anyways, right. um, Right. Isn't it amazing when you start to reflect and look at the breadcrumb? Okay. So for the listeners, this is something that this is the, um, the outcome of that, because it's nice to like uh, pat ourselves on the back and be like, Oh, see, this is good. Let's keep going. But the real thing here is the acceleration. So I did always know when I was in Silicon Valley, building my career and all these different things and accolades and, you know, wins and successes, I was able to look back and be like, oh, this had to happen. Then that had to happen. This and that. Okay, that makes sense. I was like still mindful. I just okay. wasn't into spirituality. But now doing this deep dive of spirituality and so much of the quote unquote inner work, it's like I can see how I've really done what I did before in terms of uh, just do things, not necessarily know why, but now that there's the intentionality of being like, oh, I trust as you put it the and mm -hmm. surrender to the flow of the universe. And I see the synchronicities, whether it be through uh, spirit numbers or whatever it might be, and starting to really work with that intuition and discernment as you say yes to more things. What I've noticed in the past six months, six to 12 months alone is there's been an acceleration of my growth that it's just more and more expansion because I'm putting more and more trust. And there's mm -hmm. something you said a while ago, I forget what you said, but it was essentially about being present with uh, being present. You know, I don't remember exactly what you said, but the more we can be present and notice these things and be connected with nature, then the synchronicities that are affirming to us, yes, keep going. This is on the right path. You start doing things. You might not know why you surrender. And then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, oh man, all this growth is going. One caveat there is I did want to mention this too. Like at the beginning of your story, when you were saying the startup was tanking and you had to let 40 people go, all that type of stuff. There's this feeling in life and for everyone listening, like, you know, you're clearly on the past path. If you're listening to a podcast like this, and you've probably heard me say this before new listeners, welcome um, either way. There's this feeling in life like where we're either banging our head against a wall or we're swimming upstream. And in the case of like you and your situation of the startup, what I hear from that is like everything tanking. That's your perception of reality. And it's the universe being like, let me course correct you and guide mm -hmm. you versus you being like, oh, this isn't working. Let me find another startup and just keep going. Then it's like more and more is going to happen to get you on the path of going, yep. right? Mm. So yeah, yeah, you always have that inner guidance. And it's even when you feel like you're not on your path, you are because you're being given more and more evidence of what you do want and what you don't want. So you can be clearer for what you ask for and what you believe in. And actually with the breadcrumbs, I love that you said that because now looking back, I can see how everything I learned in Silicon Valley, even the most random, seemingly random projects I ended up using, like, for example, I worked on Randy Zuckerberg's book launch at the time. It's like, when am I going to use this? But I ended up learning so much about that and then writing my own book. So, um, yeah, and just random skills. But uh, looking back, it makes sense <laughs> in the moment. It might not. But for me, actually, those baby steps um, led me into so much self-doubt because actually when you finally start going towards what you want, you will face your deepest fears. They will really come up because I feel like while I was within Silicon Valley, I could kind of mask that and mm -hmm. kind of just be held or feel safe within the container of my company. Like, okay, I'm just a little nervous to speak publicly. That's it. But or I'm nervous, my boss might not like my project, whatever. But when you take that leap of faith into the unknown towards trusting your soul in that direction, you're like, 
I'm unworthy, I'm going to be a failure, I'm not good enough just as I am, those things that are so foundational to you actually start coming up for the first time almost to be really part of your day-to-day back and forth. And for me, it was a teeter-totter of one day I'm feeling a burst of confidence and joy, Mm. and one day I'm like back in the fetal position saying, I don't know what I'm doing to my partner, right? So it's so normal. And I think a lot of people are in that limbo space of right now, especially of feeling suffocated by their role or the options available to them in the conventional world. And then feeling that push from their soul of, look, you're not happy anymore. You want something more. You're here for something more, you know, and wanting to trust that, but not knowing how. You're so right about the limbo space. Like, I mean, it's, uh, hello, my old friend, <laughs> you know, when <laughs> we're back there. And it, it that resonates with me personally, the first six months or so after I did ayahuasca the first time in 2019, and really put myself on the path. Wow. It was a very lonely road. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't know anyone that would had done I knew one or two people that had done ayahuasca, obviously the people I did it with, um, as well. And then I had my meditation teacher, which he was a huge help shout out to Charlie Johnson, he wrote the forward of my book, Soul Life Bounce. And other than that, I didn't really have too many like spiritual people in my corner and joining Aubrey Marcus's mastermind fit for service was the greatest thing I could have ever done. And it really does come down to community. So for people listening, I actually recently decided to, uh, to do this new thing where we're doing soul chat. So you guys can check out, um, calendly.com slash Sam Cabert. There's a link in the show notes and totally free. And if you're feeling like you just want community or someone to talk to, feel free to book a call with me directly. Um, but yeah, I couldn't recommend masterminds enough. It sounds like you did a mastermind with, um, your like freelancer type community, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that was just in the very beginning. Um, But when I started opening up to more of the spiritual side, I thought I was going crazy because Mm. I was opening up to things and ideas and realizations that if I spoke it out loud to my friends, they would think I've lost my marbles. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. And at the time I had no one who really, I could talk to about it. Um, When I landed in Bali, which was guided, it was another synchronicity that got me there. Um, I finally found people who spoke about the things I did or who who were having crazy dreams with higher dimensional beings. And I was like, what, (laughs) what's going on? But at least I felt like, okay, I'm not crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So you do, it, it does help to find that tribe. But at the same time, it also is really powerful to know that you are safe in yourself and you don't need anyone else, right? You don't need anyone else to feel validated in your experience or you don't need anyone to see and understand you to be good enough. Like the biggest thing is to see yourself as you really are and understand yourself and love yourself and just find that self-acceptance and love. Because then you will find more people who see you, the more you're unafraid to show yourself. Yeah, I agree. I I think it's all about self-love, you know, and there's a lot of talk, talk, uh, there's a lot of talk around self-love, but the bigger talk that I've heard is around mission, purpose, and dharma. And I have an issue with that because I don't buy into that. I know that mm-hmm. it's got a long standing history, but I think it adds more pressure to people that want trying to find what their mission, purpose, or dharma yep. is to Huge. make something yeah. grandiose. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay, well, if quantum physics teaches us that the outer world is a reflection of the inner world, then maybe you don't externally need to do this whole huge grandiose thing and make a massive impact in the world. And maybe it's as simple as going within and getting your inner landscape in order, which happens through self-love, you know? I love that so much. And I resonate so much because so often, even when you do leave the conventional hustle and bustle and the conventional job, you still feel like you need to find your purpose. And this purpose, this push for that is still searching for something outside of you to feel good enough, right? And um, sometimes it's just, you've replaced 
your hustle and bustle conventional career with something that sounds more spiritual or something more aligned, but you're still pushing to find that purpose, that progress to feel like you're making it. And to me, I really had to unwind and kind of unplug the matrix tentacles that stayed on me. Right. Even after I left, left Silicon Valley, the mindset of it or the thought forms, the ways of being still stuck on me. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time, like a whole year and a half to watch it, to be aware of it, to unwind and actually come to zero point if we're talking quantum, like to stop finally trying to create something or be productive for the sake of knowing I'm on my path. And I actually had the luxury to drop all my projects, all my clients for three months. Hmm. Um, yeah, because when I left Silicon Valley, I still was like freelancing for clients in Silicon Valley. So I ended my contract with my biggest client. I said goodbye to all my other clients and gave myself space to actually be with no planning, not even visioning, not even trying to manifest my next start, right? right? And just be, and that was actually so uncomfortable for me because yeah. I really was like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Where am I going? Like, this is really, really hard. It's easier for me to create or actually, uh, even just think about what I'm creating. But during those three months, it started getting easier and easier. My nervous system started relaxing. I was taking walks on the beach, talking to friends journaling just for myself, just for fun, painting again. Mm. And the idea for my book came through meditation towards the end of that period. And it wasn't from this place of, I want to create this to become an author, to sell this, to make sure I add value to the world. It was this excitement of, I want to create this so my future children can hold it. I want my soul essence to be poured into something physical. So that was for the first time, like coming back to creating from the masculine or feminine energy. That was actually the first time I really felt like I created with both energies. Mm. Yeah. Right. And such a dance as someone, uh, both of us who are, were out of balance in our masculine uh, of that and then learning the feminine. And then it's so interesting coming back. And for me, it's like uh, coming back to old patterns, kind of like what you said earlier. And then all of that really resonate. But let's uh, switch gears for a moment here and talk about your book, The Awakening the Heart of Humanity. Tell us about your book. Yeah, it's a beautiful book with both my oil paintings and words. And it is written for this time on earth where we are shifting back into our hearts, awakening to the truth of who we are. And for me, it is a capsule of my journey, but also the energy of love and uh, confirmation I want to share with the world of you are magical. You are powerful. This life is beyond our wildest dreams and we can create it and we can taste it. So, um, yeah, it is my soul, my energy in physical form. <laughs> I love it. And your uh, paintings are beautiful. I mean, you have one uh, of, of an orca that just speaks to me specifically, but there's other ones too. And it, it, they're, I'm not just saying it like they are really excellent and you don't seem like someone who would have spent so much time in Silicon Valley. That's like, Oh, I'm going to do art. Like, it seems like you would have been doing art the whole time and not mm -hmm. like it, the, from your story, at least it didn't sound like you had time to do art after work or on the weekends, you know, but it was the first thing I did from when I was three years old. So from age three to let's say 13, 14, and then I stopped when I went to college, um, well, high school and college, and then I did not paint for 10 years straight. But if you think about what is your true essence, what is your true soul's joy and expression? For me, it's not just art or writing, it's more so channeling my love for the world, the beauty of the world, the beauty of nature, my all for life into physical form. So bringing the spirit down into something where mm. I can see it and hold it and share it with others. And thanks to my mom being into art, um, I was just doing fun projects from age three, just playing, you know, doodling, whatever. But coming back to that, coming back to that joy really helped me connect with my inner child. And it's right. so powerful to do that. 
Um, at first, you know, in Australia, I just bought a canvas again and started painting for the sake of me just doing it for myself, not even thinking I'm going to sell it, obviously. And it wasn't even thinking, you know, I'm an artist, like no way. <laughs> like yeah. you feel a bit like imposter syndrome saying something like that. Mm. But then I did this practice called scripting and you picture yourself three months from now, your future self. You really feel the energy of your future self and you write down in the present tense how you feel, how you're spending your day or how like more and more every day I am connected to my spirit. Or for me, it was actually like I am feeling free to express myself and my art is blooming and it feels so good to share it with the world. Like I really wrote things that weren't even in my reality at that time. Mm -hmm. And I actually like pictured myself and you can be specific. So I pictured myself writing a thank you note to a friend in Europe for ordering my art print, which I didn't even know how to make an art print or my website didn't even have art on it. Right. So um, it was crazy because I thanked her for seeing me and supporting me. And actually within two weeks, she happened to see a painting I shared on Instagram. She was like, um, do you do prints? Like, I would like one. And I was like, what? And as the exact person, I imagined, thank wow. you, right? So this is how powerful we are once we give ourselves permission to believe it can happen and to bask in the energy of your future self and act like it is happening now. So I started playing pretend and pretending, what if I have an art store online, right? That's such an amazing story. And that's exactly what I was talking about earlier in the example of the friend, like renting the house in the beach town when she's stuck and living somewhere else. But yeah, in terms of manifesting that, that is uh, absolutely incredible. So homework for us all, if someone is trying to manifest, just to recap what you were saying, well, what would your recommend recommendation be? Hmm. When you have space where you're not distracted, just take some time and breathe into your heart and ask yourself, how do I want to feel? Where do I want to be three months from now? And it might um, be more so this feeling. It might not be a specific vision or some people might have a specific vision, but make sure you can believe it. Like if you're completely like, no way, like if you're like, oh, I want to win the lottery and be a millionaire in three months. I mean, your subconscious is not going to believe that unless you are actually fully in that belief, which is amazing for you. But make it a stretch, but not so much of a stretch. And then journal as if you are there now. So write it in the present tense of I am, I feel more and more every day, dot, dot, dot. And read it like before bed or in meditation, like after meditating, um, so that you're programming your subconscious to actually believe in that new story. And then when you finish reading it, just go about your day and act as if you are there now, like just play pretend in your best capacity, right? So how you dress, how you think, how you see your day. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. All right, guys, that's a, that's a homework. I, I want to hear it. So send me or ask me a DM on Instagram, how that works for you. Um, but seriously though, in all, in all realness, uh, it is important. I think it's, uh, it, no, I think it is something I've been doing at the end of my meditations. I've been practicing a new meditation, which is pretty cool. And I'm digging it. I do want to speak about, uh, higher dimensional or inter dimensional beings. Cause you mentioned that and you got the orca on there. So we got some whale, uh, interdimensional beings represent. So anything you'd like to share in terms of, uh, visits or encounters with our star friends. Yeah, you know, this world is way more magical than fantasy, crazier than fiction. And from our youngest age, well, actually, like kids are connected to it. But then you start re okay. realizing like, that magic's not real, like Santa Claus is not real. So everything else must not be real, right? But right. it's actually more magical than Harry Potter and Disneyland and everything combined. <laughs> totally. But um. Yeah, in terms of the galactic side, and I do feel like many people describe this in different ways. Like in the beginning of my journey, I really felt like, oh, wow, like crazy aliens are real. Like, of course, we're not the only ones out here. Um, and then there's things to back it up, like information from the Pentagon. But then mm -hmm. you realize like, okay, we're all one consciousness. We're all connected. 
So they are just other aspects of your soul, other aspects of your higher self um, in different timelines and realities that are actually all happening at once. So that just blows your mind to another level (laughs) of like, oh my God, it's all just me, right? It's all just you in this universe, um, in this multiverse. But for me, like, I, I haven't had... And I think it's important to say like people are not going to connect to it the same way or the way you expect. So you might watch a YouTube video of a channeler who says, I was visited by beings and I remember the conversation and I got so many downloads and messages. And then you might judge that and be like, I'm not getting that. Like maybe I'm not doing something right (laughs) if you're crazy enough to want that. For me, um, I've seen really strange stars moving really erratically and fast faster than any plane in the sky so many times once in bali and in perth and australia um which just makes you remember okay i can see it with my physical eyes now the veil is thinning so more and more people are noticing these strange encounters but it shows you okay wow it's real like it's safe to trust this new knowing i'm having that there is so much more but seeing with with our physical eyes gives us that validation again. Um, And I feel like when I write, I do channel, but it is to me, my higher self, my soul. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like that because it's about trusting my own guidance. Um, Yeah. And that resonates the most for me. Mm. Yeah. The the stars specifically, I I call those the dancing stars. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh it's pretty trippy, you know, and I've I've googled it when I first noticed that a couple of years ago and there's a lot of stuff on there saying that it's like uh uh what do they say the basically your mind's playing a trick on you the way the eyes process mm-hmm. and I'm like no that's a bunch of propaganda <laughs> like yeah. get out of here with that. Um I've seen different things though. I've seen now I see the dancing stars all the time, but it started through a massive UFO sighting. And then from there, I, I would start to like UFO hunt and chase. Wow. And I would, yeah. And I, I was pretty successful for a short amount of time where I was able to not like a hundred percent accuracy, but high enough where it was shocking how much I would see like a, a UFO going across the sky far. And then it just kind of went away and Mm -hmm. I started searching more in the stars. And I used to do this every night, like two years ago, uh, almost two years ago. And, um, what through searching the sky, like, where'd they go? Like, how come they are? And this was all, yeah, they disappear. Right. And I'm not seeing them anymore. That's when I noticed the dancing stars. And I was like, what is that? And then I, I zoomed in on my phone. Have you ever zoomed in on your phone? No, I never have my phone. It, it just happened so quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the the so the thing is about the dancing stars is you can choose, it seems like almost any star and look up in the sky. And when you connect with it, like telepathically, it'll start to move up and down and it kind of travels up and then it goes to a different direction. Then it might come down and it's, but not everyone sees it. I've shown it to multiple people where some people saw it and the other people Mm -hmm. didn't see it. And I was like, okay, well that adds even more evidence to the propaganda on Mm -hmm. the internet. That's saying your mind's playing a trick on you. Cause like, this is what they say about when you're ready, they'll make contact with you. So these other people aren't ready. um, Or open to that consciousness, that dimension. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it it is interesting. It seems like a lot of us that initially go through the awakening process. Mm -hmm. One of our deep dives is an interest with ETs. And Mm -hmm. for me, I had a very, very deep interest and fascination, not just ETs, but the human origin story. And it's kind of funny. I've been looking at recently and it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a phase, but Mm -hmm. it was like part of the process. And now it's really, at least where I'm at, this grounding season of helping other people to be that bridge. And that brings me to my Final question for you, probably final, but what is it that you're so, what are you most passionate about now? (sighs) Yeah, it's similar to you where in the beginning I was sucked into so many rabbit holes because I I was just curious. I mean, your mind is blown open. So you're like, okay, what, what is there out there? And um, 
I feel like it is an initiation where when you realize how much is upside down from what you believed or how much more there is, it kind of cracks your mind and heart opening open to accept that, okay, anything is possible. If that's possible, <laughs> anything is possible. Right. But, but now I am similar to you in a more grounded state where I really just want to anchor this frequency of trust and ease and surrender and magic and flow. Um, Cause it's like, you know, it's possible and you know, there are no limits and how do you really want to feel and be now? Not even getting pulled by the present or the future or the past, but being dropped into the present moment now. Um, Cause I think there is also this excitement of, okay, the world is shifting, the world's awakening, we're gonna go into a higher dimension. You know, you hear talk about the new earth, the new way of being, and you can attach to the outcome of that and mm. feel like, oh, once I get there, then I'll feel good. And once I get there, then I'll be in my soul mission and life will be great and I'll be free and abundant. But uh, I'm also letting go of my need or, uh, yeah, need or urgency around that and noticing where it's already present and alive in my life now. And it yep. feels so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We are in a similar season. And it, it it's almost cliche to talk about like dropping into the present moment. But one thing for me is like just uh, tracing my thoughts moment to moment. And I've been getting into IFF, IFS a lot recently, internal family systems. Oh, I've heard of that a little bit. Yeah, that's a that's another fun deep dive. And it's not as esoteric. It's a lot more grounded. And okay. if the the basis for that of for anyone listening as well is uh basically it's a new uh, newer psychological practice a psychology practice where we understand that it's uh we we all have voices in our head right like i think of it back in high school at least for me i was into metal and you know i'd go hot topic and they have these shirts that say i hear voices in my head people would wear the shirts and they're the ones that you would label as weird and different mm -hmm. but the truth is we all have voices in our head and through the practice of ifs internal family system systems also known as parts work we are connecting with those voices in our head and we can give them names and mm -hmm. the idea is to become the king or queen of your queendom or kingdom and to hear these voices out and what i've noticed in in mm -hmm. kind of sitting with it in presence in awareness and tracing my thoughts to hear that voice connect with it now hear what it wants to say it just wanted to be set. Uh, it would just want to be yeah. heard, seen, and witnessed. Exactly, and by doing so, those voices start to soften, mm -hmm. and that's what stops us from, or shouldn't shouldn't say stops us, but. Uh, when we have the whispers that turn to screams and yells and shouts and all that type of stuff, and then worse things happen, well, we can get in front of it if we do mm. the practice of IFS. Wow, so, I love that. Is it? I cool? feel like yeah, it's so powerful to realize those voices of fear and doubt and self judgment. They're not actually you. You mm. think it's you because it's how you've always thought in your head, or you've always been criticizing yourself, but. Um, in meditation or when you're really connected to your heart there are practices that help you feel your truth and like your true self is actually very calm very mm. loving yeah. very whole and realizing okay that's my real me that's what I want to trust yeah absolutely yeah this is uh this is such a good conversation we've uh, gone so many different ways from you know 3d <laughs> and work in silicon valley to extraterrestrials and manifesting and you know you or me i am you listeners we're all one all the <laughs> things so definitely like a broad overview now for people that want to connect with you deeper they can obviously grab your book which is in the show notes the title of it is awakening the heart of humanity i've your Instagram there as well. Are you working with one-on-one -on -one clients? Are you still freelancing? What does that look like? Yeah, I'm doing all, uh, I guess work is a funny word, but I'm doing everything right. that aligns with me. And um, right now what, what that is, is I do um, online ceremonies, so group ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use cacao or tea or water, and it is a way to 
And it's my favorite way to open your heart, drop in and receive that guidance, those visions and anchor the frequency or the feeling you want to feel. Uh, it's super powerful. Um, and I also do one-on-ones. That's beautiful. And uh, when we get off this uh, podcast, I'm going to go heat up some water and make some cacao. You just inspired yes. me. Yeah. It, and even like a nice night ritual, that can be a good thing to ground down. But Ashmi, thank you so much for taking the time to come join us on the Soul Seeker podcast. And guys, check out the show notes because I have the links to connect with Ashmi right there. Thank you so much, Sam. You're amazing. I'm so inspired by you. And thank you for the work that you do or the light that you share in this world. (laughs) Right back to you. Thank you. 